So I want to introduce to you Richard Edelaine, or Dick Edelaine, as he goes by, um, who was uh, born in the state of Washington. So he's a Pacific Northwesterner uh, through and through, a son of a Basque immigrant livestockman and a sod house frontier mother, uh, and was ra raised on a sheep farm in eastern Washington. Ranch. A farm, excuse me, <laughs> sheep ranch. I apologize. You're exactly right. I study sheep, so yeah, I should know that. And uh, But he came here to the University of Oregon and got his PhD in a double major in literature and uh, history in 1966, and now he lives in Oregon again in Clackamas. But he left for time. He was for a long time. I knew of him, as I'm a Western historian, I knew of him as an eminent teacher at the University of New Mexico, uh, where he taught for many, many years. Uh, he has published an amazing amount of work, and a bunch of that work is available for sale. If anybody wants uh, books, I will be happy to help you buy them at the end. He was uh, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize uh, for, in, um, for a book he published in 1989, The American West, a 20th Century History, which is like a major text in the field, and it was named the main selection of the History Book Club, which is actually uh, a rare honor uh, that people get. Uh, but he also wrote a lot of great books. Uh, Reimagining the Modern American West, A Century of Fiction, History, and Art was the first book that I was introduced to with his work in, um, when I was in graduate school. He co-authored a book, Conversations, Wallace Stegner, on history and literature. Uh, and then he also wrote a book called Beyond the Missouri, The Story of the American West, and a whole bunch of other books that you can see uh, here, uh, including two books on uh, Lincoln and one on Lincoln and Oregon, which is the topic of his, speak, uh, his talk tonight. So I will turn him over to you all to listen to what I am positive will be a very fascinating talk. So thank you. <laughs> I'll be standing right here, so if I'm between you and the slides, why you might need to move around a little bit. This is a kind of coming home for me. Uh, There's some people sitting out here, for example, that uh, we lived about six feet away from in Westmoreland, and uh, I lived uh, out between uh, Eugene and Springfield in uh, one of the more spiffy areas of this. And I remember teaching at Lowell High School, and some guy said, uh, well, there's only one sort of bad area in Springfield and uh, Eugene, and he named the area where we were from. And I said, thanks. <laughs> thanks for putting us into that area. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time scribbling, and I always say that, well, if you're a Bass Sheepherders kid, you have to keep ahead of the cowboys. And they think of you as sort of less than they, so you had to, more is better. Uh, we had a sheep ranch of 10,000 acres, and we had about 8,000 sheep, and then when those wonderful ewes gave birth, we had about 15,000. So when I would tell the kids at, at high school that we had 10,000 acres, they would say, the Edeline boys are lying, because those were German-Russian wheat farmers, and anything, oh, three to 600 acres was large. What I didn't tell them is our best crop was rocks. Because if you know the, the geological history there, that's where Lake Missoula took the so topsoil and brought it down to the Willamette, which you enjoy and you don't pay rent to the <laughs> Eastern Washington guys. And we were sort of between the, the Grand Coulee Dam irrigation project and that wonderful Palouse country where, where everything grows. And in between, you tried to grow a few sheep if you could. So it was a good raising of, of livestock. My background probably wasn't much different than a lot of Basque guys growing up uh, because it was sheep ranch and my father was a Basque immigrant and he had, he said, work harder than anybody else because he didn't have any education. The difference was that I went to a school with only five kids. We were 22 miles from Ritzville and then our school was another five miles. 
and it lasted about five, four to five years. And when my older brother graduated in the eighth grade, they closed it down because the three Edling kids couldn't keep it uh, open. But I remember something in the kind of hazy background that I had a wonderful teacher who taught me about uh, the Civil War, and she had enough liveliness and balance in her life to say that Robert E. Lee and Abraham Lincoln were both wonderful people. And that taught me some balance from the very beginning. And I guess I've been a middle of the rotor all my life, which usually sets you up for being not satisfactory to people in this direction or satisfactory for people in this direction. Uh, I'm, also, um, I'm also a lifetime evangelical and a Basque. Those usually don't go together. And it's, a, it's culturally, that's an oxymoron. So maybe that's why I have the weird interest in both Abraham Lincoln and the American West. Now, historians have a tendency, and I think an awful lot of scholars generally do, to make space for their point of view. They denigrate previous or at least put them down or are negative about them. I will not do that. What I will say to you is I'm going to present an alternative point of view about the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and the Oregon country, and then I'll expand it to Abraham Lincoln and the American West. So, quite often we talk in the last five minutes about takeaways. I'm going to give you the takeaway at the beginning. I hope that you will get an alternative point of view before we leave here today about the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and the American West. And when I first sent this in, I said, a cross-continental story. And that's what I want to present, that we have a tendency to do something that East Coast and West Coast. We take two newspapers at our house. We take the Oregonian, and it doesn't seem to think that there's anything outside of Portland, Oregon. We also take USA Today, and they don't seem to think anything is west of the Mississippi, uh, including our wonderful football teams. Go Ducks! Uh, so, uh, I think there's a relationship sometimes in our singing, uh, our, our, our thinking, that we, we love that which is close at hand. And we love some of the things that are far away that we adore, but we don't see sometimes the connections between the two. I remember a major professor I had at the University of Oregon, his name was Earl Pomeroy. And in 1955, he wrote a wonderful essay called Reorientation of Western History. And I can quote his exact words. Continuities from the East Coast to the West bulked at least as large as the innovations. And that was breaking the truth. That was, that was sort of going against the Bible in Western history. Because Frederick Jackson Turner had told us it started on the frontier. And what Pomeroy was saying, you need to go back and rethink that. That's what I want you to do tonight in the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and the American West. And in our previous em uh, emphases, we've done quite often military history and the far westerners as spectators. One of the major historians of the Pacific Northwest was a man at the University of Washington and then later at the University of Illinois, our specialist in Stephen uh, um, last name uh, debating Lincoln. Douglas, Douglas, Stephen Douglas, name was Joe Hansen. And he said the Pacific Northwesterners were spectators, false. And I think I'd like to suggest to you that you need to think about Pacific Northwesterners were not spectators. They were very much involved. This is a good book. Alvin Josephi was a, a man who was a uh, editor and a writer, spent about half of his uh, year in the East Coast, uh, American Heritage Editor, and then lived in the, the northeast uh, corner of Oregon, near Joseph. That's where Joseph e. ought to be, I guess. And he wrote this wonderful book on the Civil War and the military history. It's still the best book. But people fell in love so much with this book that they didn't see other parts of the story besides military history. So I'd like to suggest this alternate point of view is that it, the story is more than military, and that it's more than spectators. And if you go away with that, I'll be very happy. I tried to do this in two books. This one that was a, an edited book 
in which I wrote an extensive introduction and then picked about 10 essays I thought were as good as any essays on the American West and Lincoln. And that came in 2010. And then in 2014, I did this book on Lincoln in the Oregon country. Next year, I have a book coming on Abraham Lincoln, the American West, and Mount Rushmore, in which I'm trying to argue again that we need to see uh, Lincoln in this cross-continental uh, point of view. These are the subjects I'll quickly go through. We'll start with uh, politics and economics. We'll talk then about slavery and emancipation and civil rights, Indian relations, North-South competitions, and then I'll end with what I think to be the most important interpretation that has come out on the American West recently. So let's look first at politics and economics. And I've done more with politics and economics than I have with military. I'm not a military historian. Now, this helps you to see how Lincoln was very much involved because when he arrives in the White House in 1861, see, these areas then will become new, t new territories or the ones that were already there, and these are the new territories that are established during that time period. Now, what a lot of us forget is that in the territorial period, you did not elect, living in Oregon, the major leaders in a territory. They were named by the President of the United States. Now, the Constitution made it clear that it could be somebody, including the Congress. But over the years, it had evolved until the President of the United States made that decision. So think about this. He's going to name the governor. He's going to name the secretary, which is almost like a lieutenant governor. And he's going to name two or three of the major judicial figures, plus some other people. So that means he's very much involved. Now, territories do elect their state legislature. They do elect a territorial delegate. And you had a civil war of opinion going on because usually the people that the president named were his buddies or people that had been suggested to him by cabinet members. They were usually non-Westerners. They were usually of that political party, no matter what the territory was. For example, traditionally, Oregon had been more Democratic than Republican. Now, in Lincoln's case, it was already a state, so he didn't name in Oregon, but he does in, in uh, Washington and Idaho and Montana, who are going to be those leaders. So you can see he's very much involved in deciding what's going to happen politically during his presidency. So let's look at uh, Oregon and the relationship with Oregon. Four of Lincoln's very good friends came to Oregon in the period in the, from the 50s to the end of the 60s. One of his uh, law partners, a boss law partner, was a man by the name of Stephen Logan. And Stephen Logan and his son David had a falling out, so Stephen sent his son to Siberia, <laughs> Oregon. So he comes at the end of the 40s. Uh, he had alcohol problems. He was a very gifted person, and he, his lifeline dream was to get into that U.S. Congress. And in 1859 and into the 1860s, uh, he came very close. But then he ran into a man by the name of <clears throat> Matthew Deedy. And Matthew Deedy didn't give in to anybody, and he could manufacture some stories that were probably not true. It didn't help David Logan. Lincoln's doctor, Anson G. Henry, also moved to Oregon. And when Lincoln went through depression, on whether he decided to get married or whether he was going to run for politics, it was Anson Henry who, who provided the blue pills, which helped Lincoln uh, to stabilize. The editor of the Springfield newspaper, Simeon Francis, also moved to Oregon in 1859. Edward Baker, who you know most because he's, Baker, Oregon is named after him, and he's one of the first senators. And if you remember, at that time period, you don't elect senators. They're named by the state legislature. So in 1860, He's named by the uh, Oregon legislature. And if you know the tragic story, the next year he's killed in a Civil War battle. So here are four very important people in Lincoln's life that came to Oregon. So there was the very good link he had with the state of Oregon. So here we have Anson G. Henry. Here we have Simeon Francis. And here's Mr. Baker. So that those connections spread also to the rest of the Pacific Northwest. This is the Oregon country that I'm talking about, not just the state of Oregon. So you see the development of the Oregon Territory. Then in 1853, Washington is established as a separate territory. 
And you see they exist until Idaho was named in 1863 and then Montana in 1864. So in the time period when Lincoln is president, 1861 to 65, about two-thirds of the Pacific Northwest becomes new territories. And that means Lincoln is going to name those top officials. Isaac Ingalls Stevens, after whom Stevens passed, is named in Washington. And because he was named when Washington was a territory in 1853, and if you know your US history, you know we had Democrats in the White House. So a Democrat, Isaac Ingalls Stevens, is named their governor. Later on, he also will support Lincoln, even though Lincoln does not name him to be governor, but he too loses his life in a Civil War battle. Uh, this is an interesting uh, person, William Henson Wallace. And the Wallace family argued that they were good friends uh, with the Lincolns. The Lincolns didn't argue that. Uh, and that's not the only happening. Uh, we sometimes know people, uh, or sometimes we don't know certain presidents because we don't want to be attached to them. But in this case, Wallace was named the uh, governor of Washington. Now, here's an interesting thing that happened. What's the most prestigious position you could have in the Western Territory at this time? Well, if Wallace's career gives you any indication, it was more prestigious to be the territorial delegate than it was to be the territorial governor. Territorial governor named by the president. Territorial delegate named by the territory. Wallace was in Washington, named by Lincoln, then runs for territorial delegate thinks he won't get reelected as territorial delegate, so Lincoln names him to Idaho. And he leaves Idaho a governorship to become the territorial delegate. So in his case, two times he does that. He makes the, the move. Uh, and was a person who was of Lincoln's temperament. He was from Illinois. And you can see that happening again and again. Lincoln's fingerprints with his friends and with fellow Republicans here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Anson G. Henry was very much dyed in the wool. And if you remember, Lincoln, for a longer period of his life, was a Whig than he was for a Republican. 1832 to about 1855, and only 1855 to 65 as a Republican. So you can see that it's for, for 25 years, he's a Whig. This man was a good friend in Springfield. And so he wants to come to Oregon, and Lincoln eventually names him the, the land commissioner in the state of Washington. Now, <clears throat> Lincoln named some good people, and he named some duds. Um, let's see, see if we can get a, just a bit a better focus there. I don't know whether. Uh, right, right about there, I guess. Yeah, I think that's about as best we can do. This man is usually labeled to be the worst of Lincoln's choices. This is Caleb Lyon. Caleb Lyon. He serves after Wallace, William Henson Wallace, uh, dropped out. Now, look to see how Caleb Lyon positions himself between George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Sound, sounds like uh, some fellow academics who like to put their elbows on the leading scholars on both sides. <laughs> Caleb Lyon goes to all those miners in Idaho and tries to teach them the beauties of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And some people said that was like trying to teach the borough, a borough the beauties of Milton. Well, it didn't quite work. And uh, he disappeared <clears throat> with anywhere from twenty dollars to $100,000 that were supposed to go for Native Americans. And he said he was robbed. Uh, I think it probably went the other way. Now, here's, here's the dilemma for the other state, uh, territory in the becoming state. Lincoln names uh, the Sidney Edgerton to be the territorial governor. He's a dyed-in-the-wool radical Republican, further to the left than Lincoln is. Lincoln is not an abolitionist. He's an anti-slavery man, but not an abolitionist, not a radical abolitionist. Edgerton was. It was a democratic state. Many of the mining areas were settled by people of Irish background who tended more toward the Democratic Party, or they were Southerners who didn't want to fight on the Confederate side and came to the West. And the same thing happened here in the state of Oregon. 
that a lot of the mining areas were very democratic. Well, Montana was primarily a, a, a state settled by those miners. And so here was a guy was facing a majority of people, well, 80, 90% of the people who had opposite party. It don't work very well in, in Montana. So we see Lincoln then being very much in, involved in the making the decisions. Now, let's move a little bit wider in our west. Let's go to California for one point. Before he came to Oregon, Baker was in uh, California, tried to run in the Republican uh, ticket, Republican ticket, the new ticket in the 1850s. He couldn't win in California. California was a democratic state. So he was invited by Dr. Uh, Anson G. Henry to come to Oregon and try. He did come, and within six months, so he was squeezing how you could. Uh, I always say that Anson Henry <coughs> learned before the Obamas and the Kennedys how you could move from one place to the other and win an election. Uh, and I'm not saying that Democrats. I'm just saying that in our time, we've had people who've moved and have won elections too. And Baker did that. And he was, it came from California. And when uh, the Californians wrote negative stuff about him, Lincoln threw it in the fireplace. And uh, do you recognize a name here? They're Mark Twain's brother, secretary to the territorial governor in Nevada. Nevada is very interesting in that it moves from territory to state in the four years that Lincoln, four to five years that Lincoln is in the White House. Guess what? <clears throat> if you get a state in, you can get the support for the 13th Amendment. And that's going to be very, very helpful. So some people say, in fact, I guess most scholars say, that in fact Lincoln pushed very hard for the state uh, relationship of Nevada because one, it get the money quickly in, make sure that Confederacy didn't get out that far, and get to get a state in and to get some more support for the 13th Amendment to end slavery. And think about the connection with the Mormons. Uh, Brother Brigham did not like Lincoln. And in part, Brother Brigham didn't like much of anything that came from Washington, D.C. because he had been so much in charge Leadership, if you know the philosophy and the theology of the, of the LDS church, and it's still there, that the president can, in fact, be a spokesman for God. And so Brother Brigham liked that idea, and he didn't like, he didn't like somebody from Washington, D.C., including Mr. Abraham Lincoln, to tell him what to do. He did begin to change his opinion even before Lincoln's death because he saw Lincoln as more moderate, and Lincoln did do some recalling of people that were very anti-Mormon. But here generally is a difficulty. About 90% of Utah is Mormon uh, in the 1860s. And here you have people being named from outside who have not only not any identification of the Mormons, they don't like the Mormons. So here was the difficulty of trying, in fact, to be a territory and be ruled by people who were anti-Mormon. So here again is that map that shows you how Lincoln comes into control on uh, politics. And you can see the three uh, territories that are organized during his presidency. And you can see some of the others will come in a little bit later as states. So not everything that had been territories comes in as states. Well, I tried to argue in this article I did for Montana Magazine that Abraham Lincoln was a political founding father of the American West. And the way I argued that is how much influence he had, and I used the Pacific Northwest as an example. When you could name the three top officials in all those new territories, and you could have all those, those influences, it meant that an awful lot could happen here. Abraham Lincoln founded the Republican Party in the Pacific Northwest. The Pacific Northwest by itself was not Republican but it became increasingly Republican because of the influence of Abraham Lincoln. Well, let's go on now to economics. These are three very important events in the Lincoln administration. The Pacific Railroad Act, the Homestead Act, and the Land Grant College Act. They all occurred in 1862, and we cannot, I'd like to be able to prove this, but we cannot show step by step that Lincoln was the pusher for these. He, he supported all these. Lincoln 
arrived in the White House as a Whig, even though he is a Republican by name. And the Whigs believe that Congress ought to initiate legislation, not the President of the United States. So when he got there, he supported this, but he said these should be enactments by Congress. And there's almost no uh, correspondence between Lincoln and the congressional leaders who pushed these through. But we know that he supported all of these. So if you think about uh, the 1869 uh, coming across, the 1874, uh, 64, so 69 completed, but established in 62. The irony, of course, is that very little was built before Lincoln's death in 65. And then uh, Lincoln was told by the big companies that there wasn't enough support. And if you look at the specifics, there was a lot of support. But they were able to talk Lincoln and Congress into getting the double the support and establishing here. So here's the railroads, the importance of the railroads. Now, here's the artist's rendition of what it was like to be in the homesteads. Now, look at, look at the reality. <laughs> a little bit different, maybe. But think about this, 160 acres, uh, almost free. Uh, Lincoln believed that especially people who had served in the military, because he got a land grant for serving in the, uh, in the war early, even though he said he didn't shoot anything but mosquitoes or something like that. Uh, so he believed that you ought to establish 160 acres, virtually free, and if you proved up on it for about five years. And uh, women could be involved in those grants too. So that's very important in moving west. Now, let me ask you this, and uh, listen to all my questions because then they increasingly will have meaning. <laughs> Any bobcats here? Any vandals here? <laughs> Any cougars here? Any beavers here? Okay. Those are all land-grant institutions here in the Pacific Northwest. And this is an example of a Midwestern land grant. Here's what it said. And it had been pushed, and uh, Mr. Buchanan, the Democrat previous to Lincoln, had turned them down. We think you ought to establish institutions for agriculture and the mechanical arts. What was the first name for Corvallis? A&M. A&M, Agricultural Mining, Agricultural Mechanical Arts. Still got a couple of A&Ms, right? That place down there in, uh, in Texas that thinks it's a wonderful football power? <laughs> uh, so, agriculture and mining, all right? How do you establish them? Congress would, and it was a lot of difficulty of voting back and forth. Congress, let's check your math here. Congress will give 30,000 acres for every member of the U.S. Congress. So minimally, minimally, what is every state going to have minimally? 90,000, right. So you have two senators and one congressman, everyone. So 90,000, that's going to be set aside. If anything is sold, it goes to fund the establishment of a college. Quite a few Westerners didn't like the idea. Here's why. It didn't stipulate whether the land had to come from your state. So the Westerners were afraid that Massachusetts was going to come to Oregon or someplace and choose all of their land from the West because much more of it was open. So Westerners were a little bit reluctant, but it did pass. And if you know, it has had a lot of impact. Well, all three of those things I just mentioned had economic impact, and Lincoln was supporter of, of all of those. All right, let's go on to slavery and emancipation. Historians argue back and forth, and there's no unanimity, but I'm going to tell you my point of view. I believe that slavery was the most important reason why we got into a civil war. But I think people that are regional sometimes don't put the other part in. I would say to you, the expansion of slavery into the American West, or whether it happened, together, when those are married, slavery and the possible expansion to the West is more important than just slavery itself because those two political parties were very intrigued with who's going to get the West. And it was established all the way back in 1847 
when a congressman from Pennsylvania by the name of David Wilmot tried to, in fact, say, if we get any land from Mexico, the Mexican War was on, there won't be any slavery in it. So his proviso says no slavery if we get any land. Well, it passed one house of, of Congress, but not the other. Lincoln was a Wilmot proviso guy. And by the way, he was in Congress, U.S. Congress at that time. So his point of view in the 19, 1850s was no expansion of slavery into the West. It was the platform of the Republican Party in 1856 and 1860. So Lincoln was speaking for that. So he was a person very much Im important for him to make sure that slavery doesn't go into the West. All right, we know, of course, this important event in 1863 in the fall, uh, first sort of tentatively established and then completed in January of 1863. Um, I like to think about Lincoln and his time. Because this is the difficult thing. I think of Abraham Lincoln as our greatest president. But I also, and I'll, I'm going to follow up here, Abraham Lincoln was a racist. If you mean by a racist that a person does not believe black and whites are equal. Lincoln did not believe that. So if you think about what we think in 2019, then some people want to dismiss him as a racist. If you want to think about Lincoln in 1862-63, he wants to free the slaves. I would suggest to you the best way to see Lincoln is he was on the forefront of some of the changes that he wanted. He didn't go as far as the radicals, the abolitionists, but he wanted to make change. And one of the things he wanted to push for was this, and then eventually he wanted to push for the 13th Amendment, which would come later. Ironically, of course, put into effect after his death. Now, cartoonists had a wonderful time with Lincoln. And many of them were very negative. And here it is saying that Lincoln, you know, he wanted to do all. This is like a dream I had once in Illinois. So this is a person saying that Lincoln is, you know, dreaming about the, the Emancipation Proclamation and that it isn't very realistic. And this one says it's Abe Lincoln's last card. So he's tried everything else, gunpowder and stuff, and that hasn't worked, so now he's going to try Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, a, a, uh, an artist uh, was in the White House for about six months, and he talked, uh, this is his painting of the, uh, the cabinet meeting, and he talked a lot about the discussions that were made in moving gradually toward the Emancipation Proclamation. Very interesting to see how Lincoln sort of tested the waters with things, with, with some of the individual members of his cabinet and then with the cabinets uh, beginning in the midsummer. And he announces it, and Mr. Seward, uh, right here, says, don't announce it without having won a war because it will seem like you're doing something without really having the means to do it. So he, went, or he waits until after Antietam, which most military historians would say it's almost a draw. It is true the Southern Army withdraws from the battlefield, but Lincoln waits until after the Antietam battle, declares it a victory, and then announces the Emancipation Proclamation, gives them the amount of days from then until the 1st of January of 63, and uh, then he announces it in 1863 as a, as a final thing. Now here's a cartoonist really showing you a point of view. Let me say about it because it's going to be foggy back there. Here is a body on the altar. And here is, the first one is Negro worship. And this one is spirit trapping. And this one is free love. And this one is socialism. And this is uh, atheism and it's nationalism, I think. Yeah, nationalism. I don't know how Puritanism gets in here, but it's down in the bottom. Well, here's the negativity of what he is, what this cartoonist is saying, is that Lincoln is sacrificing on the altar the, the American because he's piling all of this Negro worship on the, on the backs of all this negative stuff. Well, what, what I'm suggesting to you is there was not 100% support for Lincoln and the Eman Emancipation Proclamation. Now, this is the one that strikes me. This is a new word in 1860s. 
miscegenation. It's been around a long time, but it was new in 1863. Here is a picture of, if you look, if you're careful and you can see it, white guys and black women dancing. Uh, if you wish, cheek to cheek in both meanings. And if you look over here, you can see there might be even more than just dancing going on. This is a very negative thing in which they're saying Lincoln wants to, in fact, mongrelize the white race by intermarrying. Now, if that feeling is there and Lincoln is countering it, it suggests how much he was moving away from what some strong opponents were believing. All right, now, here's where there's some criticism of uh, Lincoln by people who are sort of middle of the road. Hapius corpus, the suspending of that, we, we, we do it in shorthand by saying the right for trial for jury. And he started it by the difficulty of trying to bring soldiers from Boston to Washington, D.C. to support the, the North. And in doing that, he had to bring them through Baltimore, and Baltimore was a pro-South area. And he had a very difficult time getting the soldiers through that area because they would be attacked or the airplane, the uh, railroads would be stopped. And so he used habeas corpus, in fact, to stop the people and to put them in jail without any sort of charges to get them off the scene because they, he said, were trying to upset the war plan and they were pro-Southern in their point of view. Gradually, Lincoln would say, I will suspend habeas corpus when somebody tries to stop the war plan. And I'll give you about three examples. Sometimes, he would leave it up to his generals to suppress newspapers that were negative toward the war. I'm going to give you an Oregon example in just a moment. And then he had sometimes to deal with Northern politicians who were pro-South in their emphases. Now, this is a Eugene crowd. There ought to be somebody in here who recognizes a fellow Eugenian. Yeah, right. You're, now, you got half of a footnote, but you've got to give his name. Uh, he was in California and Oregon. I'm trying to think. Uh, First, he was in Oregon and then in California. You know him as Joaquin Miller. Yeah, Joaquin Miller. And... Um, do you know that he was in a newspaper that was a forerunner of the Eugene Register Guard? Yeah. His family was pro-North, but he was pro-South. And uh, he's probably the most important Oregon literary figure, not because of his political point of view, but he, he, uh, he made a name for himself after he left the United States and went to England, and somebody said to him, uh, Mr. Miller, why have you... So appeal to the Brits. He said, I tingle the duchesses with my beard. <laughs> I don't think it was his poetry, maybe, but although they were evidently smitten by it. He came back, and he tended to be a, a, a person who waffled on Native Americans. I was trying to think of the town over there where the famous uh, Chinese place is, uh, Gut City. John Day. Uh, John Day. No, not John Day. Um, one, isn't there one that's a smaller one that has city in the, as part of the title? They, I'm, I'm trying to give you Joaquin Miller's house in, in Columbia, not Columbia City, but it's something, it's a little small town, but it's not John Day. Huh? Canyon City. Yeah, Canyon City. Canyon City. That's where the Joaquin Miller house is. And he was there for a while. Uh, I don't know whether he had a law degree or anything like a law degree, but he did practice law. Uh, married another uh, writer, fall out, and then he goes to, the, to California, to England, comes back, and he becomes a, a major figure in what's called the local color movement in American writing in the last part, same time that Mark Twain's sort of at the top. Uh, but he was very outspoken in being pro-South here in Eugene. Now, here's a way that you could have a difficulty and see what they would do if you didn't want to serve in the war, they would make you a pair of shoes like this and show that you had the difficulty walking because one leg was shorter than the other, but not one leg shorter, but one foot taller, one shoe taller. Well, 
this kind of thing could lead to your, your habeas corpus because it was something upsetting uh, the war program. Um, sorry that the uh, uh, caption down here, but this is a famous uh, lawbreaker in England who in the 1600s uh, wanted to uh, make England into a Catholic country, went to Spain and tried to bring Spanish and Catholic leadership back to England. Fuchs, not Fuchs. Fox. Fox. Guy Fawkes, Guy Fawkes, Guy yeah, Guy Fawkes. And so this cartoon is trying to suggest Abraham Lincoln is in fact an American Guy Fox in what he's trying to do. And this person uh, likes to suggest that Abraham Lincoln is, because he's guilty of suspending habeas corpus, he steps on the freedom of press, he's Abraham the last, and he's monkey-like, animal-like. Well, here's Mr. Valendingham, an interesting uh, Ohio politician, and he spoke out and uh, here, Lincoln probably made a mistake by allowing his military leader to throw him in jail. Lincoln makes quite clear that he probably wouldn't have done that, but the military leader did. Then they, here's a nice Lincoln story. Valendingham, his name, is in jail. And somebody asks him, what should we do about this? And he, he says, well, let me tell you a story. He said, went to a party and this teetotaler was the host, and somebody came to him and said, uh, should we spike the punch? The host looks at him and says, if unbeknownst to me, it would be okay. Lincoln uses that story when somebody says, shall we get Valendingham out of the country? And all he has to say is, unbeknownst to me, so he's sent behind the Confederate lines, eventually makes his way to Canada and runs for office and is beaten soundly. I can just see Lincoln chuckling in the White House. <laughs> okay, uh, Indian policies. Uh, Lincoln was not very successful in this area uh, and uh, I, I won't grant him too much grace, but I would say to you that when you get 15 to as many as 50 telegrams a day trying to work out uh, military uh, decisions in, uh, in the Civil War. It was very difficult to address an Indian system which it was said it was corrupt from the top to the bottom. When Lincoln talked to people, he said, I'm going to do something about this when I am, I'm able. And he made that promise two or three times, but he did not. Uh, and he did favor the idea of concentrating Indians on the reservation his man, Mr. Dole, who was the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, that was his idea, and Lincoln supported that idea. Sometimes when he got treaties <clears throat> dealing with Indians here in the Pacific Northwest, he would just send them on to the Senate. If you know, they have to be okayed by the Senate. And he really didn't comment on them, and so far as we know, he didn't pay much attention to them, just sent them on. And he did believe that religion, religious leaders uh, should be, in fact, to Christianize Indians. So now here are four or five where he had contacts. None of these are Pacific Northwest because he didn't have specific contact dealing with Indian affairs here in the Pacific Northwest. The most important is this one, and it's had the most writing uh, about it. Remember the famous one where it's the largest mass hanging in the United States, 38, 39, on December 26, 1862, uh, 303 people were declared guilty of murder or rape, and the military people sent in all, three, uh, all 303 names, and Lincoln said, now wait a minute, wait a minute. And with journalists and legal helps, he reduced the numbers to 38 or 39, and uh, those, he said, were guilty of murder or rape. Uh, John Ross, uh, the uh, leader of the Cherokee, and uh, because the Indians in the, what's now Oklahoma, but Indian territory, didn't get the support of the North, they caved to the pressure of the Confederacy. And it's hard to see any other thing than they could have done because the Confederates were on the scene and putting pressure on. But John Ross leaves and goes to, to Washington, D.C., and he and Lincoln meet. And Lincoln promises him a lot of things, but it doesn't happen. Uh, Indians do visit, and Lincoln says, 
how could he have said this? Uh, something about like my, my red-blooded relatives, you need to stop fighting. Uh, we whites are not doing, and right in the middle of the Civil War, they're fighting. But he's saying to the Indians, you shouldn't be fighting when, in fact, that's what the United States is doing. Bear River, just north of uh, Salt Lake City, in which really, really a bad massacre occurred. And then the Sand Creek in, uh, in eastern Colorado. Uh, and Lincoln knew about some of these things, but he didn't really respond. Uh, and he himself, uh, we can't confirm this story, but it is said that in, when he was in that Black Hawk War in the 1830s, that in fact an Indian kind of stumbled into camp. The military wanted to shoot him, and Lincoln said, no, you're not. If you're going to try to shoot him, you have to shoot me. If it's true, then we see that Lincoln was pro-Indian in some of his points of view. This is that layout of the, the famous uh, Sioux situation in, uh, in Minnesota, South West Minnesota, in which there were a lot of white settlers killed, and uh, the treaties had not provided the support uh, that they had been promised, and so they rose up, and uh, the Indian leader uh, led them in revolt, and then they were captured and went into South Dakota, and it was an ongoing problem of not being solved. But in this uh, December 26th, this is that largest mass hanging. I'm going to give you a test. I tried this with my students. All right, 303 are declared guilty. Going to hang all of them, according to the military leaders. They send all the names to Lincoln. Lincoln says, no, wait, wait. Gets the journalists and the uh, lawyers to look at his stuff and uh, reduces it down to 38, 39. Uh, the reason I keep saying 38, 39. 39, and then at the last minute, the name got changed. So it was maybe 38 rather than 39. So is Lincoln to be criticized because he allows 38 people to be mass hanged? Or is he to be praised for saving the life of 260 people? My students vote for the criticism. It's interesting to me. I'll not give you my point of view. Well, John Ross, who was a person of, of thoughtfulness and very much became a, an acquaintance of Lincoln, I wouldn't say a friend, because they weren't together that much, but he was in Washington, D.C., and they met on at least a half a dozen occasions. This is that site out there in, in eastern Colorado, which Lincoln heard about, was negative about, but he really didn't react to it. And when those Indians came he tried to do Indian talk, pigeon talk to him. Me talk to you. You need to stop fighting. He didn't seem to know much about Native Americans. By the way, his grandfather was killed by Native Americans, and historians and biographers make a lot of that. All right, military policies. Here were the three goals that Lincoln had. Clear the Mississippi, divide the Confederacy, and these two, of course, go together. You want to clear the Mississippi so that you can ship the goods out of New Orleans. But you also, in doing that, you want to divide the Confederacy, so Texas and other areas in that part stretching out to what is modern-day uh, Arizona would be divided off and protect California. Make sure that California doesn't fall into the Confederate camp. Two reasons. One, the ports and especially the gold. And that's one of the reasons why the gold and the minerals are very important in Nevada. He wants those to be in the uh, northern uh, treasuries, not in Confederacy. So if you look at that, it shows you that he wants to free the Mississippi and then doing that, divide these two parts, and then protect here. And if you remember the, the only major, well, two major, there were some uh, P, P Ridge here in Arkansas, and there's one here in northern New Mexico where there were actual battles, important battles in the Civil War. Sabian, this is, Sabian Pass? Uh, I guess you would say Sabian Pass. That's Texas, isn't it? No, uh, Red River. Red River, okay, all right. So uh, a lot of people dismiss sort of the West because they don't think of much of it being west of the Mississippi. And my point is that it, it had impact. Uh, a lot 
west of the Mississippi. And this was the invasion. Uh, I lived in New Mexico for 22 years, and uh, the motto of New Mexico helps you to understand how they feel about Texans. Poor New Mexico. So far from heaven, so close to Texas. <laughs> so New Mexicans are a little bit like Oregonians in California, uh, especially if you're Tom McCall. And, and so here was one attempt, and it was turned back in the northern part of New Mexico. And after that, there wasn't any push into this area by the Confederacy. Well, certainly the North-South competitions, and think of the names that they use for one another. Copperheads, these are the northern criticisms of the South. Dixie Democrats, and remember that most of the leaders in the North, at least Lincoln's party, were Republicans, not Democrats. They're butternuts, traitors, Knights of the Golden Circle, which was, by the way, a national organization, and there were uh, something like 100, 200 members of it in Portland, Oregon. Now, look at the negative ones on this other side. They're unionists, which is kind of neutral. Yankees, but you need to put damn right here, right? Damn Yankees. And black Republicans, and of course, they were nigger lovers. This was a phrase that was used by Southerners about Northerners that they disagreed with. So you see here, here's the, here's the copper heads, and these all have the faces of the Southerners. So this is the North talking about having to face the Copperheads. It took a long time for us to be able to gather together and to support, but most of the West was uh, pro-North here, a massive meeting in California. The largest pro-Southern areas that were supportive of the, the South here in the Pacific Northwest were mining areas like, and uh, this one in uh, just, just outside of uh, Medford, uh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville, in Jacksonville. Uh, and there were, uh, there's an author that lives down in the South, he refers to this area as Little Dixie during the Civil War, that that area from Roseburg kind of south or maybe even Eugene South, uh, was in fact pro-South in its points of view. And there were, as this cartoon is showing, in fact, the Confederates are gleefully destroying areas in the West. And of course, here's the Republicans going after the Democrats, and it says, the trouble is those old copperheads, they are people that are just getting toad soup being served by the Southern leaders. So here's is suggesting that these southern leaders have no more uh, sense than eating up that toad soup. Now, I like this one. There's not much truth in it, but it's a good one. <laughs> President Lincoln's proclamation in the rebel Senate. So it's saying here, this is when Lincoln announces Emancipation Proclamation. They bring out their knives. They're going to look at all the hair standing on end. And they're going to go after Lincoln. It took a long time for this to happen, and it did here in the Pacific Northwest, too. But there were a few in Washington, D.C., and in, uh, here in the Pacific Northwest where they marched for, for some unity. And if you think about it, how many places have Lincoln? Counties, towns, sections. We have spread it out. Now, my last point. The Greater Reconstruction. Now, there's at least one professional Western historian in this, so I'm going to give you my point of view. I believe this person is the most important Western historian writing in our time. Uh, and it is he who argued for the Greater Reconstruction in his presidential address about 10 years ago or more to the Western History Association. Here was his point. If you've been listening carefully to me, I've been plagiarizing Elliot West along the way. His argument is, if you were in US history courses, you got a lecture on the reasons why we had a civil war. 
you got lectures and chapters in your readings on the movement West. Elliot West says, marry them. Marry them. That you need to see, and he did, did, does it around the subject of race, that you need to see, beginning with the Mexican War in the 1840s, stretching up to the conflicts in the 1870s and 1880s. It was the movement into the West and the struggle over slavery and things dealing with slavery that once married are the best explanation for what happens in American history between the 1840s and the 1880s. So we use the word reconstruction generally for the 1865 to 1877 period because that's the word we use for government policy during that time. Elliot West is using it for a different subject for a broader period of time. I buy it, and I think it's very, very important for us because not only have I just said to you, you need to think about the West and the East together, you need to think about Oregon and Lincoln together, you need to think about the Civil War, the reasons why we had one, and the movement West. You need to marry them, and if it means that it's a spin-off into a third idea, that it's neither just the coming of the Civil War or just the movement West, it is a greater reconstruction that tells that story. And he's been pushing that and uh, I buy it. So we have seen these views as we've moved through from Lincoln and economic slavery now to the greater reconstruction. And I'd like to think that we need to learn some lessons from Mr. Lincoln, especially in our time when we're so divided on things. In about a month, I'll be going over to Boise, Idaho to talk about the meaning of the um, Lincoln's address in uh, the, the Gettysburg Address. And I'm going to say that it taught me early on how to be a middle of the road person. It is very difficult in our time to be middle of the road. Now here's what I mean by middle of the road. If you're a Republican, push your Republican agenda. But don't spend all your time attacking the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, don't spend all your time attacking the Republicans. Because our country needs your support. When you're for something, spend your time primarily for that, not your time denigrating something else. Now, that doesn't please Democrats and it doesn't rep please Republicans. I understand that. But I think Lincoln taught us with charity toward all, what's the rest of it? With malice toward none with charity toward all. And that's in his section. Teaches us something, and I think we still have some things to learn. If we learn them, we'll have long old Mr. Lincoln a little bit longer. Thank you very much. I know that some of you may need to leave, but we'd like to uh, offer some time for questions and answers. And then there's also books for sale uh, after the Q&A. Uh, so please, if you want to uh, get one of the books that uh, Dick Edelin has, has written, we encourage you to do so. So anyway, who's got the first question? Yes, sir. Because, because he made, uh, you mean 1856 or? Okay, so you're talking about the later thing. In 1856, he does support him. John Fremont is our first Republican presidential candidate. Lincoln supports him. When he is then a general during the Civil War, he frees the slaves or says they ought to free the slaves. And Lincoln says to him, no, that's not your decision. That's not the general out on the the uh, field making that decision. And of course, John Fremont had the support of the abolitionists, the radical Republicans. They were very upset. But Lincoln said, the law of the land is you don't make that support. Well, that, that made tension very strong between them. And uh, the strongest of the two was Mrs. Fremont. And she goes to the White House and keeps Lincoln awake for about three hours, uh, telling her, uh, him why her husband is right. 
and uh, Lincoln wasn't as kind toward her as he could have been, but she was a difficult person also. So uh, he didn't support the efforts of John Fremont as a general in the field to free slaves. He did support him political in 1856. Thank you.